Welcome everyone to What the Force and welcome to a new episode of The Power of Myth and Symbolism in Star Wars. And with me today, almost always, is Ty Black. Yay! <laughs> welcome, Ty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. I feel like it's been for a long, like a really long time, though. Uh, yeah, it's been a little while because you missed the last one by accident, right? Not on yeah. purpose. So you were gonna be there, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, honestly, like I was like just not gonna have the show without you, but you're like, <laughs> no, just have it. Cami is amazing. It was a good conversation anyway. Without yeah, me, it so was, was super good, and like Cami came prepared with receipts. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but so I'm this, back. <laughs> this one is a is a super fun one, and actually was very much influenced by Ty. Your video that you did with uh, the boy with horns, the boy without mm-hmm. horns, the boy, the, the boy. Bo- I called it the boy with the little boy with the horns on his head. Yeah, yeah, and and it it it's because that concept is very much in exploration of what we call from a psychological term perspective the shadow of the self Mm -hmm. and the shadow is you know both the thing that we (laughs) when we are in light (laughs) reflects behind us but Mm -hmm. also it is considered to be the psychological baggage by which we don't want to look at (laughs) yeah it is the thing that we uh, fill with all of the negative things that we don't want to consider or talk about or look at about ourselves, we hide it away. And so it's we, always in the dark. Yeah, we put it behind us. Um, there's a lot of different ways to explain it. There's the I could I, I find this interesting. I couldn't explain it to my parents in in a way that made sense to them until I called it our baggage. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden they they knew that term. That's something that they called it themselves. And it is your baggage. Like, it's kind of a weird, it's a weird way to talk about it, but it's the same thing as calling it your shadow. Um, and we'll we'll get into how Bly talked about it, but Bly talked about it in a very similar way and saying that you take it and you put it behind you into a bag and you carry it around with you. So it is kind of the same as calling it your baggage. So and why it's your shadow is because you drag it behind you and it yeah. it's dark and it's it's almost like carrying around like um like a trash bag, a black yeah. trash bag filled with all of the garbage and the things and your baggage that you you don't want to look at and that you don't want to open and it's kind of smelly and <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like you don't want to consider it. Yeah. And um you know this from a from a very high level perspective this all comes from the you know sc- psychological school of thought of freud who talked about our id which is our basic um sort of instinctual things that we want to pursue you know food sex <laughs> you know mm-hmm. th- th- things we want out of out of life that if we were not controlled by uh, society pushing down on us we would just be id monsters out there <laughs> in the world, right? So that that's where Freud kind of thought about it. But uh, Jung, who deeply influenced Campbell and George Lucas, um, very much views the shadow or what he took to be the id in a sympathetic way to the mm-hmm. self. Mm-hmm. And we might use some psychological terms, but we'll try to break them down into kind of clearer layman's terms in, in a way. If to clarify them for everybody mm-hmm. who might not have maybe read all of this. Yeah. Why this is important is because, again, this influenced Campbell. Mm-hmm. Joseph Campbell, you know, the hero with a thousand faces, <laughs> <laughs> spoke a lot with George Lucas, influenced George Lucas's writing of yeah. the original trilogy and also worked with him directly in the 90s as he was considering a new trilogy and figuring out what the story actually meant and how it could relate to humanity. And also we know George was also influenced by Jung himself. Mm -hmm. People that decide to look at George Lucas's ideas outside of the realm of Campbell are missing everything because Mm -hmm. Campbell would go to Skywalker Ranch and talk to George about his idea of the modern myth and what it meant and how he was representing, how he was using Star Wars to 
try to teach people kind of the same things that Campbell was hitting upon with how he saw myth and how he saw how folklore affected every generation. So that was like, that is literally the whole point of Lucas's journey with writing Star Wars. And I, I don't want to say it's the whole point. Obviously, he had tr- he had bouts of trying to take advantage to make money off of toys and whatnot. And he lost himself along his way in several areas. But but the fact that he kept going back to Campbell and he kept like looking at Campbell as almost like as his mentor, mm-hmm. that, that means a lot. That means a lot to the story. It affected the story very, very much so, even on the subconscious level, which it matters if we're talking in Campbellian or Jungian terms. So it's incredibly important to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was very much influenced. He wanted Star Wars to mean something more Mm -hmm. and to tell the true human story. And and he wouldn't have... He wouldn't have asked Joseph Campbell to help him understand what is the most humanistic story that he could possibly get to if he didn't want to incorporate that into his storytelling. And this influenced not only the prequels, but the Clone Wars especially. And we'll we'll hear some of that um, as we explore that, especially his last episodes that he actually produced. And now we know he's been involved in the sequel trilogy. That mm-hmm. is now out in the open that he was involved. And both Ty and I were like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> it was no surprise at all. Yeah. Like Ugh. he had conversations. He wrote down what he thought. He worked with these storytellers. And it was very much a collaborative experience to get us to the point where, you know, we can talk about these things because they make sense if you view it through these lenses. If you view it through these lenses, Star Wars makes complete sense. And if you deny it, it's like denying your own shadow. It's yeah. not going to help you. Yeah, definitely. So <laughs> that brings us to our thesis for this, actually. Because, like, what does that mean, like, denying your shadow? A lot of the time, you know, people view Star Wars as black and white, dark versus light, good versus evil, resistance versus first order or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever political iteration it is of the time. This conflict has been going on for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Oh, what war? What fight? Oh, the fight against the dark side. Yeah. A little Maz Kanata quote on there. Yeah. But what is the fight? (laughs) Like, it's so much more complicated than just defeating the dark side because every single person in the Star Wars universe is faced with the moment where they have to... front their darkness and what does that mean in a psychological way and how can we learn from that other than just defeat your darkness it's not about defeating your darkness in Mm -hmm. star wars and we've talked about that a lot it's about confronting your own inner darkness and incorporating it into yourself so Mm -hmm. that's what we're getting at in here and and we're gonna go back to right like Jungian. we're gonna go all the way back to even some freud like let's Figure out what got us from what they were talking about, you know, and fr- that that is incorporated into all of our modern day psychology, which went from Freud to all the way to Campbell to even George Lucas. So mm-hmm. I'll let you say the uh, our little thesis statement. Oh, thank you. I thought you were totally going to go for it, but you, that setup, but like that was beautiful. Yeah. All right. So. Our thesis statement for this episode, so you can kind of, you know, walk the path with uh, with us, know where we're going with this, is the shadow is a part of us. We instinctively fight it in order to explore it and understand our true selves. How this relates to Star Wars is that the story uses the shadow as a thematic element to tell both as archetype and symbol. That was a lot of words. (laughs) But in short, the shadow is important. And in Star Wars, it represents both in the universe as a collective unconsciousness, the dark side, and in ourselves being pulled to the dark side. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important. Like, think when we talk about the shadow is the pull to the dark side. It is the dark side in ourselves. We're going to talk about why that's important when people start talking about the dark side in the story and how it's evil, things are evil, you know, but they miss kind of the point. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah. Right? <laughs> I really want to talk about this one quote from Robert Blythe. And we're going to talk about Robert Blythe specifically. And the reason we're going to talk about him is because his book, A Little Book on the Human Shadow, is a really good way to quickly understand the shadow, how it relates to us, how it relates to Jung, and how it relates to Campbell. He was a poet, actually, <laughs> and not necessarily a psychologist, but he uses his ability to craft words to actually talk through different aspects of the shadow and what it means for humanity. And why it's important is it's probably on the shelf of the Lucasfilm story group. How do we know this? Yeah. Because Ryan Johnson tweeted saying he read Jung and he read Blythe. Mm -hmm. Specifically, Jung, he read A Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And for Blythe, he read A Little Book in about the human shadow. Mm -hmm. These two books are a really good place to understand the whole conflict of a galaxy far, far away. Yeah. Yeah. And the important thing to take from this is that like these are male authors. Like these are male authors that wrote about like what it means to be a man and what it is to represent like masculinity. Like there was this idea of this, you know, loss in a lot of Bly's works. He inspired a movement called the Mythopoetic Men's Movement. And the idea behind this was that he was trying to re-explore what it means to be masculine, what masculinity was to the modern generation in the face of industrialization and commercial commercialization. Because he believed that they were getting away from, in, in the modern society, was getting away from uh, traditional ideas of what a man could provide to his family and to society. And this is not like a, this is not an idea of like, we need, like men need to be more than women or men need to overcome women again or anything like that. It had nothing to do with that. It was more so in a re-exploration of men's place in the world without the ability to, to be what they were before in a way, like there's always kind of that re that reassess the the re, like reassessing one's place and like one's role in society when big movements happen, and that was something that was felt by a lot of men during that time period. And Campbell tapped into it, Bly tapped into it, and it was happening right around the same time that um, feminism, modern day feminism, was happening. So there was a lot of kind of of a rest, almost like a wrestling between the two sexes. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of our modern day ideas about feminism and the, hmm, I won't get into the politics behind it, but a lot of it was hijacked by the modern day men's movement. Mm -hmm. A lot of what Bly presented was hijacked by the modern day men's movement. What was inspired by his works in the early 90s it was... was Valuable. It was very mm -hmm. valuable. And it was based off of very, very compassionate ideas about humanity and about men and about women. And it was about self-exploration. And I think that means something. Even if you disagree with it, it means something. It's something we can take note from. I feel like I should sing the Pink song in lead up to this, to this little mini quote I'm going to say. Because, you know, does everybody have a dark side? <laughs> right? And so the pink song, like, everybody's got a dark side, you know, they, she uses that quote in one of her songs, can you see mine? And so mm -hmm. in the book itself, Booth and Blythe are having a conversation. <clears throat> Booth is the, William Booth is the editor of uh, a little book of, on the human shadow. And he's like, is it possible for someone to not have a shadow? And Blythe's answer is, have you ever seen anyone walk in the sun and yet the shadow was missing? Yeah. And Booth replies... Uh, it would have to be a very thin person. <laughs> and Blythe is like terribly thin, perhaps transparent. <laughs> right? But transparency could either imply a person is insubstantial or that he or she has nothing to hide. Right. Fascinating. Right. Right. Yep. And so we replace the word shadow with dark side mm -hmm. within the Star Wars universe. That is that is what we are saying is that the dark side is the shadow represented on screen 
in our books, in our media. It is whenever there is light, there is darkness. Mm -hmm. There is a shadow cast. Mm -hmm. Greater the light, the greater the shadow. Is that like the yeah, 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 powerful light, powerful <laughs> darkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. Right. And that in balance, there will naturally be light and dark happening mm -hmm. within nature. It is mm -hmm. natural to have shadow. It is natural to have light. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I think we, we already covered this a little bit, but like the basic the, the basic line of inspiration that we have that gets us to Star Wars is that uh, from a modern day psychological mythopoetic perspective is uh, Freud, then Jung, then Campbell slash or Bly, I guess, then Campbell mm -hmm. and then George Lucas. Mm -hmm. And now we have the story group. We have the story group who has taken inspiration. Story, the storytellers, I would say, maybe, you know, the story group on some level, but also the storytellers of Star Wars nowadays. Mm -hmm. We know this influenced specifically George Lucas because we, we got an amazing uh, arc for Yoda at the end of the Clone Wars, just before um, they were kind of forced to stop making episodes. <laughs> and it was uh, Yoda's Lost Missions. Mm -hmm. And specifically during that arc, he goes and explores a force planet. And there's so many interesting concepts that were brought up during these episodes. And actually, if you go and talk to, uh, you know, Jason Fry, if you go and talk to Claudia Gray, which I have, they mention these episodes as fundamental to understanding Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And within that, within all of the things that happens, Yoda goes to a force planet, which has a dark side location, which he is told to go and explore. And in that dark side location, he faces himself, <laughs> 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 which Many people lovingly call evil Yoda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did you think of this episode? Like this this whole idea of Yoda being uh, like, an, he goes and fights like literally the evil version of himself. <laughs> I, I thought, I always thought it was kind of like, I'd seen it a thousand times before. So I was like, ah, whatever, he's fighting. Yeah, sim his symbolically, like we see this a lot in media, like yeah. this idea, this concept. Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought, oh well, you know, he's he's feet he's he's fighting his ultimate bad, like his potential for for being bad, his potential for darkness. Mm -hmm. Just like how like Luke saw, you know, Vader, uh, or he saw he saw himself in Vader, like when he went into the went into his own cave. I thought it was more like reminiscent of that and. Uh, That's I look at it differently I, now, but yeah, that was certainly a shadow moment that yeah. he experienced. Like he was um, trying to understand as he enters the cave in that in that experience. It's so funny because Yoda. Now that we know, like, <coughs> Yoda experienced a similar situation, and he's like, "What will be in there?" And Yoda's like, "Only what you bring with you." Yeah, and that's like what he experienced. Right. That makes so he, much more sense. He knows that his shadow. Is within the cave. Yeah. And that, truthfully within the shadow, the Vader that he fights is actually himself projected out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that we're, we're going to get into that in the moment, but let's, uh, <laughs> let, we'll come back to that, but let's, let's actually uh, listen to the clip of that episode. Yeah. You can hear the, the amazing act voice acting of, uh, of Tom Kane. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's like playful the shadow right yeah and the shadow because this is a podcast you can't see but the shadow is a shadow wispy version of yoda and he's got red eyes looks like a gremlin yeah, and actually, like, the, the direction that Dave Filoni gave Tom Kane to act him out was, like, a weird gremlin, uh, go goblin, slash... Like, you can hear the, like, 
and golem aspect of him. Yo, yeah, he hates me. Yeah. Little homage to Gollum. Yeah. Oh my god, that's that's Gollum. Yeah. Yoda plays not with me anymore. Yoda uh, plays not with the shadow. And now now the shadow and Yoda are fighting. I choose not to give you power. And yet you spend your days in the decadence of Ooh, ah. Nile of the Shadow. And with that, I'll grow inside you. Know your true self. Ooh. Face me now, or I will devour you. No, oh, that's always the fear, right? Mm-hmm. like head buddy him. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you hate what gives you power? Yoda thinks me not worthy. <laughs> Recognize you, I do. <laughs> mm, so, so much going on. <laughs> Stripping away the persona, stripping away the projection. Yep. Right? So he is using the force to blow away the, the projection. Reject you, I do. Yeah, so we're Reject. gonna actually talk about whether Yoda has ever been correct. But yes, <laughs> he he actually grabs his shadow, holds him in his hand, and destroys him, rejecting the shadow. That's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. From everything yeah. that we've read, that's a problem. I have an issue. <laughs> I have I have a query. Yeah, no, this is really really fascinating from a couple of couple of perspectives. So first and foremost, let's let's just talk about Yoda. Yeah. Yoda fails to protect the galaxy. He has made mistakes. Mm -hmm. And eventually when he comes back from this experience, the first priestesses ask him, "Hey, do you understand now?" and he's like, "I think I do." But all of this is he destroyed his shadow so that he could become transparent. Mm. Do you understand what that means? Yeah. He he destroyed his shadow so that he could become a force ghost. Pure. Yeah. It it it's kind of like oh god. But he can but never not, be but he can, can never, never be in balance. Yeah, that was going to say he could never actually be his true self. Yeah. He might be pure, he might be totally on the light side. But he will never know his true self. He will never know his true self and will never be able to bring balance to the rest of the galaxy. Yeah, which is why he he, he never did. It's, yeah, it, it, it makes sense. He never interpreted whatever prophecy he, he listened to correctly. He never truly read into anything because he didn't know his self. Yeah. And also he gives like not great advice to Luke about yeah. his own shadow. Yeah. Right? His father facing his father and the projections that he's got on him. And we're going to go into those things. But I just want to lay the groundwork of Star Wars understands the Star Wars storytellers mm -hmm. on mass understand these things enough to tell stories in a cartoon for kids. <laughs> yeah. What else what else did you catch in there? It's very short. It's very short. Everything I was thinking of kind of disappeared whenever I saw him destroy it. Because But you gotta remember that Yoda is not successful to bringing balance to himself or to others. Yeah. Which, He's not. 
He is transparent because he doesn't have a shadow. Yeah. You think that maybe, you know, he, like the shadow that he was fighting, and this is when we watch these stories told a lot, you know, we see like a, uh, someone fighting the darkness inside of them, someone fighting the anti them or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's they, they have to defeat them. They have to defeat that that. That, that could be a, a method of consumption. Yeah. It could have been. When the shadow is literally telling him, you fear a power. Mm-hmm. You are this, you are that. He's he's telling Yoda his greatest fears. Mm-hmm. And instead of Yoda saying, yes, I do have these fears, instead of talking about them, he says, I reject my fear, essentially, right? Do you think that any force ghost is actually succeeding at anything? Ooh, damn it. <laughs> so, okay. So let me get this right. Do you think that like force ghosts are... Manifestations of failure to control the shadow? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I can't control myself. Um, yeah. I love your reaction. It was beautiful. <laughs> Well, no, because, like, what does Force Ghost Yoda tell Luke? The wrong thing. No, 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 no. I'm talking about Force Ghost Yoda in Last Jedi. Oh, well, I was going to say in, uh, because in, um, Empire, he tells him to, well, not in Empire, in, or, uh, what's the? You must kill Vader. He tells him he must kill Vader, but then he tells him to leave his friends and. Yeah, that's Empire, yeah. That's Empire. And then, well, Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's, that's Yoda, Yoda. But yeah, no, Force Ghost, Force Ghost Yoda says, <sighs> greatest, the greatest teacher failure is. Maybe that's Yoda actually figuring out things. Yeah. And he is perhaps closer to the version of the shadow because he is back to being playful. Yeah. You're right. Right. Oh, shit. That He's actually back to being explains playful. things. Yeah. So. He had his own journey to understand his own shadow. And I think that he is without shadow when for a long period of time. Yeah. And, and, and he is, it only leads to more and more mistakes in some ways. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about other aspects that we need to consider. (laughs) So (laughs) (laughs) when we start to gain a shadow, Mm -hmm. we project that shadow outwards into the world to seek to understand it. And psychologically, this happened again with Luke in the cave. Yeah. He entered the cave with the intention of fighting, the intention of doing battle. He was like, "Uh, I don't know what's in there. It's dark. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm going to bring my lightsaber. (laughs) And so he does battle. And then he finds within the darkness is only himself. Yep. Yeah, he sees his face in Darth Vader's mask. He his ultimate enemy is not Darth Vader, it is what is inside of himself. Which Yoda also faced and mm-hmm. also Yoda had a failure. In and I I don't know that Yoda sees it as a failure in that moment. No. But he understands when Luke enters the cave that killing what he fought, his shadow in the cave is failure. Mhm. That is why you fail. Yeah. I think that Yoda had a lot of time to think on Dagobah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's really, really interesting either way. Yeah. We do see a lot of this thematic element come forth in the saga itself. Mm -hmm. I see it also in Return of the Jedi in how Luke chooses in the darkness He's sitting in the darkness and he's being tempted by Vader being like, I'm going to, you know, he's talking to him. Vader's talking to him with all of his like taunts. And as soon as he touches on the things that he's afraid to lose, Luke steps out of the shadow and engages with the shadow and fights the shadow, which is his father in this situation or whatever projection he has put on to Vader, the monster, etc. Mm-hmm. And only when he chooses to no longer fight but understand Vader does he kind of win. <laughs> yeah. He understands, like, there is no fighting the dark side. Yeah. It is, it, you can only understand it and eat it or, you know, bow into it and say, yes, it is. It exists. Ooh, or embrace it. Embrace there, it, Because there yeah. is this idea of... 
when you understand it completely, that you can fully embrace it as almost a, uh, almost as a, like this is, this is eating it in a way that Bly, Bly talks mm-hmm. about eating your shadow. And I think, I think the but reason why. I think, I think it, what he means by eating it mm-hmm. is that it becomes part of yourself and you can yes. start to play with it and you can start to understand that aspect of yourself. Yes. He just, he just meant it from a, it needs to be reincorporated into yourself kind so, of way. So I, yeah. I tend to take it as this, and play, playful is the right word for it, because eating it is treating it as it's easy. Like, it's easy to just put it back in. He's saying eat it because he's saying that if you can just look at it that way, then it'll be easier. And then once it's back inside of yourself, then you can, like you said, you can play with it. You can better assess it. You can't wrestle with it and fight it and tr- push against it. This push and pull, it's so melodramatic. And, and that is a way of understanding it as well. But <laughs> if you can just project it and then just eat it, then it might be a little bit easier. Because that that way you're getting back to like why you put it behind you in the first place. Why you projected it when you were a child. Why you got rid of it. Why it's in your baggage. Just Put it back inside mm-hmm. of you and figure it out. <laughs> and, you know, the shadow appears because, you know, there's obviously a light and there's an expectation that mm-hmm. you are pure and good and the badness should be hidden. Right? Exactly. The badness or the or the natural thoughts, sexuality, um, uh, I'm angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and they manifest, the shadow manifests manifests because we we deny self right we deny things about us that are actually true so women deny parts of themselves that are masculine and so we project those aspects onto others around us Mm -hmm. so like you know the ogre or the hero like these archetypes that like we give to others, especially male figures. So is our father the hero? And we project that part of ourselves out to them. But that's actually part of our shadow. It's part of ourselves. Yeah. The yeah. masculine and the feminine. And that happens with men too. Like the feminine in the masculine is denied so much that she almost gets angry. I actually have a really good quote uh, from Robert Blythe mm-hmm. on that one. And do, let me just say like, Mm-hmm. To, to kind of summarize a little bit more from what you were saying was that uh, Robert Bly sees a thing that happens in childhood and when you were, you were very, very young, where basically a, a little boy or a little girl acts out in anger. And you know, I described this a little bit in one of my videos, but, but basically mm-hmm. a little kid acts out in like anger and frustration in their most natural, instinctual way. And a parent, usually a parent, will tell them, don't, stop it. Like, you can't act that way. That's not appropriate. Um, that's not mm-hmm. accepted, which is totally fine, by the way. That, that's a totally fine reaction from a parent to yeah. teach a child how not to act, uh, you know, inappropriately. But for little boys, it's often they're expressing their, what Bly likes to call, a wickedness. And that is actually a naturalistic side of them. It's something that comes from, it's wildness is a probably a better term for it. Exuberance. 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 Energy. Energy. Stop bouncing. Stop bouncing. Stop, (laughs) stop moving. You know, like I, you know, like, oh my God, stop jumping off the couch. You know, that's me as a parent. Yeah. Or uh, my brother used to get, my little brother used to get tantrums all the time. He used to get angry. Mm-hmm. So it, my you know, parents pushed, pushed that down. Like, you know, you can't act that way. You can't express that. And, and, and oftentimes the failure there is not asking them why they feel the way that they do. They just tell them to not express it the way that they're expressing it. And for little girls, it's their power. So little girls have this immense power mm-hmm. that they show when they're young. They, they, they feel this, this emotional prowess and they express it there. They try to exert dominance over everyone. And their mothers yep. or their fathers will say, you can't do that. You have to, you know, you can't say that. You can't, 
you can't wear that. You have to say this. You have to use your manners. You have to act like this. You have to say that. And around certain types you have of to people. Be demu- demure. Demure. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, be a polite young lady. And it, and it suppresses their power. So women or little girls, I guess, will put that power into their baggage, into their shadow. That becomes their shadow. That becomes a part. It's still a part of who they are, but they put it behind them. Mm -hmm. Whereas little boys will put behind them their wildness and their wickedness. And also their femininity. The wildness and wickedness is feminine in nature. Just like power is masculine in nature, which is why society Mm -hmm. tells us we can't express those things because they're against our... Like gender, gender. Norms. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so what happens from mm-hmm. a, from a Blythe perspective and from a Jungian perspective is you know especially with the anima and animus, which are the female and male uh, aspects uh, of ourselves that are opposite of our gender or our, uh, cho- you know our chosen gender, mm-hmm. is that so from a male perspective most males in our culture put their feminine side or interior woman into the bag they just put the whole thing (laughs) into the bag and when perhaps around 35 or 40 they're trying to get in touch with their feminine side again she may be by that point truly hostile to them (laughs) i love that quote so much the same man might may experience in the meantime much hostility from women in the outer world. The rule seems to be the outside has to be like the inside. So if you are not in touch with your femininity on the inside, you're probably not going to be able to understand femininity in the outside world. Oh boy. This is why <laughs> this is why so much of our um our our fandom and, and and women especially but men who are involved in our side of the fandom as well have this angry reaction like like very angry it, it's it's unnecessary i've done it i'm i'm at flame for this as well but you know we, it, it, like, it's like oh boy ty is picking fights <laughs> yeah i always pick fights with other with guys um who who respond to me a certain way or who give me a response i've seen a thousand times you know, it's not just guys it's also women it's also that- women yeah denying their own femininity and have chosen to take on almost like a hyper masculine persona not knowing that they are not that not knowing that they are yeah. it also happens there too so like i think it's just really important to be aware of you know and and again this is like meta thought like oh, <laughs> why why am i bringing out my trash bag full of garbage <laughs> that is my shadow and and like again it gets smelly if you got too much trash in there you gotta you gotta take care of it but we see this happen in star wars because again star wars is this humanistic story Mm -hmm. right we know we know and ty and i have talked a lot about this and i especially in our feminine gaze and heroine's journey episode which if you haven't listened to it i highly 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 recommend it but we talk about the missing feminine in star wars and how as we are pivoting into you know, the sequel trilogy story, how it is being told from a very feminine perspective, but it is feminine with the masculine, masculine with the feminine, this whole idea of balance. Mm -hmm. And it's so, 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 so important to understand this. Yeah. So there's this really amazing clip from Joseph Campbell that is obviously towards the end of his life. And I say this very lovingly because it seems like the same Campbell that was in those last, you know, that last episode of The Power of Myth and Symbolism with Boy- Bill Moyers. And it's a lecture that he's giving where he talks about he talks about projection and love, but he does so in a very like humor it, it's a very hu- like humorous way and I just really love it and I think it's really and important. Comes my masterpiece This diagram shows (coughs) that knowledge of the unconscious is gained by the ego by way of projections. The unconscious, and this is something that is really serious, unconscious is unconscious. You don't know what's down there until you experience it by way of a projection. So, a woman walks in the room and I'm struck. 
what's happened? She has received my Animar projection. I was a dimple here or something like that that mother had, and there it is. I don't recognize this mother. I think it's that out there. And then I married the creature. Um, now, I don't know what I'm doing, really. The, uh, what I'm really uh, joining up with is a projection of my own psyche. And it doesn't take long in marriage for a fact to show through. And uh, here comes the typical uh, problem. Now, what are you going to do? You thought you were marrying this, and you got that. And uh, there are two possibilities. One, you can say, darling, I am uh, disillusioned. I'm taking my anima back for reprojection. <laughs> and uh, this, this can go on. <laughs> the only alternative <laughs> is to uh, transform passion into <laughs> compassion. And... Uh, Say, and well, divorce. dear, <laughs> yep. all right, I accept the fact. And then there comes mm -hmm. uh, th mm. what we call love. Uh, uh, love is really the relationship to the person. It's a person-to-person -person relationship that develops. Otherwise, um, th there's tension, but there has to be a reconciliation with the fact world. And this is called maturation. So... <laughs> Wow, that was that was so good! <laughs> oh my goodness! So um, there's compassion and love and all of these things that we consider to be, you know, light side and the understanding of ourselves within the other. Yeah, is the reconciliation between? Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh my goodness! So, so oh, I, that was so good. So let's like. Um, deconstruct for, yeah well because for people that are like you can't see the video obviously but the coolest thing about this video um, obviously the audio is good enough but he has up on the screen while he's giving this lecture what looks like his a, a very rough version of the hero's journey yes and the top the top part He's got it cut off just like in his early versions of – if you've ever seen a graph of the hero's journey, uh, the shadow realm is bigger than the than the real realm. The, the, the feminine is in the shadow realm. Right. For the, for the hero. <laughs> yeah. You got, a, 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 from a man's perspective, going into the hero's journey, you have to explore the unknown. And the unknown is made up of the feminine for mm -hmm. a man um and it's made up of his shadow and it's made up of these 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 natures that he put behind him when he was a child that he all of a sudden has to explore in in order to find his true self in order to become a hero and mm. it's so funny cuz when Campbell is talking about this he's talking about it so flippantly like Oh yeah, this this happens to everyone, and this is my life's work, and this is what happens when a woman walks into the room and you marry her, and you go, oh, you marry crap. your mother, yeah, <laughs> you marry your mother, and <laughs> well, you marry you marry your projection of your feminine animus that you also projected onto your mother. Yeah, you now use that animus to project onto your future spouse to be like, you need to fulfill a certain role of my subconscious, right. So mm -hmm. for the male, it's the anima, and for the woman, it's the animus. Um, Sorry, yeah, I it's used fine. The wrong terms. Well, you're a woman, so it's fine. <laughs> so, I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you use the right term for you. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> nice save. Yeah. Drinking my beer. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I found that uh to be very. Cam yeah. Campbell Campbell had a humor about him that was, especially towards the end of his life, that was very feminine, and mm -hmm. very understanding, and very much in tune with um, his shadow. And I feel like I feel like he, I mean, he wrote all of his notes for the goddess towards in the last yeah. in the last couple of years of his life, and yeah, um, and that was a reflection of the fact that he felt like he had done a disservice to the feminine in his work. Yeah. 
Ugh. Which is fascinating. It kills me. It kills me. Yeah. I love him so much. <laughs> and, and there is a lot of critique of, of Campbell that you can have throughout his whole life. But in the end, he really did try to reconcile his own femininity with and 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 his view of the femininity in society and culture and humanity mm -hmm. um that was missing i love redemption this, stories i love redemption stories <laughs> and we got to put that into perspective and say this was the joseph campbell that was talking to george lucas yes this was the joseph campbell a hundred percent this was this was the one who said well wait I guess we can have a modern myth. I, I guess I guess Star that is Wars okay. is modern. I guess myth. Ma Star he Wars is modern. He changed his myth. tune. Yes. Yeah, like he changed his tune in when asked when Star Wars originally came out, he's like, No, I haven't seen it yet. Yep. And in near the end of his life, when he was speaking with George Lucas, he said, Star Wars is modern myth. Yep. Because he talked and to I Lucas. am working with George yep. Lucas on the new Star Wars movies. Yep. Be on Star Wars. Because Lucas got it. Lucas understood it. Lucas might have been Lucas might have been led astray during his journey to write Star Wars. He might have been he might have been disillusioned <laughs> like the Jedi. But you know, he but he Campbell and Lucas Maybe caught up in his own image of himself yeah. <laughs> like the Jedi. There's lots of there's lots of disillusionment that happens in the prequels, and we can see that happen with the projection of what the Jedi think is is bad throughout the world. We can see that in how, uh, you know, the Jedi are trying to do what's right. right? Yes, the Republic is trying to do what's right, um, but they ignore the bad aspects of society. Yeah, they ignore the slavery. They ignore. Um, the shame that the Jedi Order itself brings upon its own members. Yeah. And the new storytellers, all of the storytellers are doing a fabulous job of exploring the fact that there is all of these aspects within, you know, the Republic time that everybody struggles with but ignores and it's this secret shame, which is, of course, the shadow, collective unconscious shadow, mm -hmm. slavery. Again, we have talked about in the past in our Minds episode, slavery and mining and all of these aspects of the dark side mm -hmm. as representation, as, as motifs and thematic elements of the dark side mm -hmm. is that there is this shadow sickness in the galaxy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> So before we get to your meta, 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 meta thoughts. Oh, goodness. Um, let's talk about like what projection actually is in the way that Campbell sees uh, your, your shadow. He talks about projection immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, in the way that Bly talks about the shadow, he talks about projection immediately. Almost immediately. But they also talk about dreams. And I just want to take a sidebar mm -hmm. quickly to talk about dreams because, you know, again, this call comes from dream analysis. So Jung and Freud. Freud, yeah. Blythe also talks about dream analysis. And dream mm -hmm. analysis is internal mm -hmm. projection. Mm -hmm. It is the only way our shadow, again, unconscious, doesn't actively talk because we have silenced it. <laughs> tells us things directly is through imagery and experiences and like you're like why am i dreaming about my mother mm -hmm. <laughs> why is my mother this evil witch that is cackling <laughs> well you know why actually it's because you've projected your shadow on her and your subconscious is trying to tell you that you need to figure that out yes figure out how to reincorporate it into your body mm -hmm. a lot of Jungians tend to hear the word projection and they go they, they dismiss it. They go, oh, that's a negative thing. We don't want to do that because it doesn't make us figure out where we, where we need to be. Because Jung had a really weird way of talking about projection. It wasn't very healthy because let's be honest, like Jung, Jung's psychology, like his entire way of processing like everything, like he experimented on himself. He put himself through agony. He put himself through depression. He put himself yeah. through things that is very unhealthy. And he never truly dealt with some really serious things. So his ideas of projection are that 
they were negative in a way. And so whenever anyone talks about projection nowadays, they say, oh, you're just projecting. Stop projecting. Oh, I think you're projecting as if we shouldn't be doing it. But in reality, the only way to truly understand something that you don't understand or something that you dislike is to project first. That is the first Mm -hmm. step into understanding something that you don't get or something that you don't like. Is to actually be able to get it out of yourself Mm -hmm. and out there on someone else. Yes. I don't like this. I don't understand this. It's because it's inside of you. Mm -hmm. You don't get it about yourself and you don't like it about yourself. So this leads us very interestingly (laughs) to The Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. And we know know Kylo Ren, Ben Solo, projects lots of stuff. (laughs) Lots he's, of stuff. He he he's projecting all over the place. Mm-hmm. But specifically, there's a really interesting um, symbolic experience that Kylo Ren that happens to Kylo Ren in the Last Jedi, and I want to talk about it because of you know the Ryan Johnson connection. We know he read this. We know he read Young. Mm-hmm. He hates many aspects of himself Mm -hmm. and i want to talk about what he specifically hates with you after because i think we should probably speculate on this a little bit and i'm kind of at a loss of what (laughs) what the projection is yeah but he hates luke skywalker Mm -hmm. so much Mm -hmm. throughout tfa through it is his driving motivation is to find luke at the expense of many 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 other things Yes. That only pivots a little bit when he meets Ray. Mm-hmm. But in the end, in the in the chance to confront Luke, rather than maybe taking a safer route or an easier route, he wants to confront him directly. And Luke, in that moment, is literally a projection. Yeah. Literally a projection. So he cannot be harmed. Mm-hmm. He can only be seen and understood by Kylo Ren and his words and the things that he hates about himself mm-hmm. can only be understood. And he what? And he tries to kill. He tries to kill that projection, but he can't. But he can't. He tries to destroy the yep. projection just like Yoda did. Yep. Just like Yoda did. I'm going to reject you. Dis- reject yeah. you you are no longer but no luke does not allow him to mm-hmm. what <laughs> i love it i love it so much oh my god it's so cool it's so cool i think it's interesting like a lot of people have had issues with like we don't know a lot about ben we don't know a lot about like who he is like what he actually wants where he comes from it's because a lot of the time that we've seen in his journey so far he's been projecting on everything if you can just take that and turn it back around on him you can see exactly who he is we might not know what he my wants, old but- man is weak yes he was weak like his father. Yes. Uh, I killed him like I'm going to kill you <laughs> like my father. So he literally kills himself when he kills uh, Han Solo in an attempt to kill his own weakness. Yeah. yeah. And it, what does it do? It makes him weak. Yeah. Because he's a compassionate boy. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. he's, a, he's a compassionate boy. What are the Soft things boy. that make him... What what are the things that make him stronger? Let's talk about those. Mm-hmm. Understanding his loneliness, which he has projected upon Ray. Mm-hmm. Understanding that and having compassion for that loneliness and accepting it back back within himself. Yes. Ooh, his, that fire scene. Oh, his connection with Ray is is the is that equality. It's that it's that weird mm. connection between the masculine and the feminine. They both Mm-hmm. have similar experiences but different experiences and they project upon each other yes. in an effort to share and understand their own shadow which is literally reflected on the walls behind them in that scene <laughs> because of the fire <laughs> what is going on in this movie it's still so brilliant it's so visual yes every time there's a sim- every time there's a symbol in the story there is a visual it's directly visually yes. symbolic on screen yeah it's insane. 
It's insane. It's insane. <laughs> I wanted to mention real quick before we get in, into the examples in Star Wars explicitly. Yeah. Because I know we, we've already begun, but it's okay. I, I did want to say real quick, because I, I meant to say this earlier, the relationship between Freud and Jung that went from a inherently sexual to an inherently personhood type of idea because Freud, Freud, Freud believed that the, he didn't believe in the human subconscious. He believed that all of our instincts were driven by sexual needs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that comes into like, everything is based in, um, in sexuality. Right. From an id perspective. Yes. And then as you go through different phases of your development from a, from a consciousness perspective, mm-hmm. you go through different um, phases of that and that expresses externally through your behavior. Right. And whenever Jung started talking to Freud directly, they became very close friends. Then upon their first meeting, they talked for 13 hours straight about like ink blot tests and word association tests and uh, repression, all of these things. And what they disagreed with each other about the most was that Jung interpreted one of his dreams, which he went to Freud about, he interpreted one of his dreams as him finding the human subconsciousness. And Mm. Freud kept focusing on um, these two skeletons that were in his dreams. Well, who were they? Who did they represent? Who in your family did they represent? And Young kept Young kept saying they didn't represent anyone I knew. They represented humanity. They represented history. Uh, what came before me? And Freud didn't believe him. And so a lot of their disagreement kept coming back to this this dream. So eventually, Young left kind of what was Freudian yeah. thought. They like they separated. They out separated from a thought perspective. Yeah. yeah. And really, it was just like bad turkey. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll go with that. Uh, but but you know, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, Young took Freud's idea of uh, what dr- what drove humanity. He took it from the sexual instinct, and he took it to the subconsciousness. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is that. Freud still comes up and Freud is still relevant because it's kind of still about sex. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Because it, it ends up being about the feminine and the masculine and, and the balance between ourselves and that. Yeah. Yeah. And peop- it's just a, di- it's a different lens on how to, how to interpret it. And it doesn't, if you say sex, people are like, oh, sex, that means I'm just a, an animal, all these baser instincts. Whereas if you say feminine and masculine within ourselves, people are like, you know, <laughs> I can kind of get behind that. <laughs> it's just it's just different at branding. It's a different branding. Oh you know, God. they rebranded for a new generation. I'm dying. <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, though... <laughs> You know my degree is in psychology. That, that's why it's funny. <laughs> yeah. um, in, in all serious seriousness, um, when have we been? I mean, <laughs> <in this show>? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about sex. <laughs> We're talking about sex in Star Wars now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, PSA: It's all about sex. All of Star Wars is all about sex. That's all it is. <laughs> If we were to look at this from a Freudian lens. From a Freudian lens, everything is about sex. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yes, so it's yes, easy. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. The missing feminine yeah. is all about how Vader uh, is missing both his mother, which he was sexually attracted <laughs> to at some point, and and Padme, <laughs> who he misses from a sexual perspective. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's all, all right. good. Anyways. <laughs> we're moving past. <laughs> I'm keeping this in. I can't believe I brought this up. Um, all right. So that's all. All I wanted to say was that. Well, that there is. Yes, it is still. They are saying the same thing, but in different ways. And, 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 and what I was trying to get at, like from an actual story perspective, was that the, the story, even told from like a purely Jungian perspective, still requires an aspect of love and family and even even procreation 
Yeah. As as weird as it sounds, like because it's expand on that, yeah. Because it is about humanity overcoming all everything. It, it's about humanity passing down, uh, passing the lessons, the lessons, that yeah, they, that they have learned, and and also it's about uh, the completion of the adolescent arc into full adulthood which involves passing on to the next generation. Yeah, it, it, it's very very instinctual. It's very much basic human so you, nature. You're saying Raylo babies? Is that uh, the the outcome? Hashtag #Raylo of- babies a thousand percent. Yes. Yes. And I've gotten heat on this before on my on my uh YouTube channel cuz there are you know, there are people who are asexual and there are people who don't want children. And I understand that. But at the same time, it's like this this is representative of of a the, the reproductive arm of humanity. Yeah. Let's just say it like that. Yeah. Let's yeah. Just say it like that. That's I the mean, best way to put it. I, you know, again, not all experiences are going to be told within the Skywalker. Setup. No, they can't be. They can't be. And d- that doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity for more story and for more experiences to be told in Star yeah. Wars. And I certainly hope so, that we get all sorts of different uh, levels and understanding and experiences throughout the whole saga. That's my little PSA. Absolutely. Um, but again, if if the Sk- Skywalker saga, the nine movie arc that was told over 40 years, is trying to say something about humanity which is they're probably trying to say something about the reproductive art uh-huh. of it what well what does it mean to reproduce what does it mean to have children and to pass on these ideas if you learn something mm-hmm. and you pass it down why what's the point what's the purpose that's why there they're can telling be other that. ways that that stories are are passed down yes like generationally yes. but but, but this, generations involve babies but the, and, like to, to, and this story started as a family soap opera type of thing so Mm -hmm. it's about family it's about passing it down Mm -hmm. so but you know yeah i agree there there are other ways of passing down the story it's it's just that this one was so intertwined from the beginning that's what it that's basically what it is yeah and we have to view things through the lens of the episode one to nine yeah because that is the story that they are telling us they are telling Right, right right so we have a family of Skywalkers, single mom, child, right? right? Um, that is brought into the saga that produces two children, which carry on the generation. And now we have a uh, Ben Solo, Ray mm-hmm. conversation happening. Yeah. So how does that resolve? That is different. That is resolving the issues that were presented in the first movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's complicated. Damn it. Yo. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, we haven't gotten into the, we've got, well, we talked about the visual. We, we, we touched upon the visual representations of this already. I mean, people get shadows across their face. Like Kylo Ren literally <laughs> is in the shadow and he steps into the light when he speaks with Bray yeah. in The Last Jedi. Like, it's literally all over the place. Just go and watch it, Luke. In the shadow, when he's talking to Darth Vader, who is representative of his projection of his shadow in that moment, and then he steps into the light to confront his his shadow, and then he ends up understanding and consuming or incorporating his shadow within him. Did I say that too fast? No, that was perfect. You've said it before, so. <laughs> no, I was just summarizing for those that, you know, fell asleep while I was <laughs> Repetitiveness. I assume good. that's what people. Ha- Why do people listen to this podcast? I still don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, MC. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, Let's go back to to Anakin. Yeah. And I, I kind of want to talk about our good little boy, our little oh. child boy, our little baby boy, our little baby boy. <laughs> so, oh my god. Mar- Marie Claire messaged me right before the show, or right before we. Reco- we started recording like a, and she was like trying to understand something like, wait a minute wait a minute so anakin anakin couldn't have and this is basically what you were saying and you can correct me if i'm wrong but like anakin could not have taken he his mother never told him like stop it like you're not being good like put away that wickedness put away that that whatever you have inside of you no no she was she was she was nicer than that Mm -hmm. and this is this is fascinating this is fascinating so i don't know 
I don't know if you remember this because you're significantly younger than me, but the poster of Anakin and the projection of the Vader shadow yeah. on the wall. Like that was one, I think it was like the IMAX poster or something. I've seen it recently. Yeah. The Phantom Menace came out. And I always thought that was like the dopest picture. I was like, that one specifically was for Megan and Derek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That dopest. The dopest of the pictures. Dopest. <laughs> Dope. The dopest. The dopest. But Dope. it was awesome. Yeah. It was so cool. I was like, yes, we are going to understand how this good human, this human that is in the light, this special child, the special little boy yeah. has the darkness within him. Yeah. Right? That's bigger than him. That's it's bigger projected. than him. It's bigger than. Yeah. It's projected. Okay. So what does Anakin's mother do to him mm -hmm. that produces shadow? He says, she says to him, generally, you're such a good little mm -hmm. boy. You're so good. You're pure. He knows nothing of evil. Yeah. She tells Qui-Gon. He knows nothing of evil or greed. Nothing. I've never, he's never known anything. Okay. <laughs> oh, Shmi. I love you, Shmi. I love you so much. Mm -hmm. You're such a cool lady. You did such a good job with your son. But to deny the shadow is to allow it to grow. Absolutely. Right? And that's the problem with, with the situation is that she saw none of his shadow. He has shadow. How do we know? Are you an angel? Mm -hmm. He already was interested in Padme. In in some aspect of of trying to understand the world. Yeah. Right? He sought power. Yeah. He wanted to win the race. He had no fear. He had zero yeah. fear. So even Anakin Skywalker is perfect and pure as that little boy. All light side. Mm -hmm. Right? But as soon as you deny the shadow, it grows. Mm -hmm. Right? You you are this pure, perfect version. And and we're gonna talk about this a little bit as he grows older. He is the pure, perfect version of a Jedi. Yeah. But he has shame because he has hidden his true shadow with his wife. He has hidden his true self from the Republic, from the Jedi, from the galaxy. He has hidden his true self from Padme. And we see this play out a lot in the Clone Wars when he has fits of rage. And because she expects him to be different, not jealous. He was jealous of Senator Rush Clovis because of his previous uh, relationship connection. They kissed once. <laughs> I mean, we now know that. They kissed once. Yeah. Uh, and she was like, this makes me highly uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, you're kind of weird. Uh, Senator Rush Clovis, he was very, very jealous of that. And he and Padme very much viewed him in and almost ignored his shadow because she knew it existed. She accepted it previously when he went and slaughtered a whole village of sand people. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Let's talk about that scene for a little uh... bit. <laughs> You don't want to talk about well, it? I don't know what there's to talk about. <laughs> Other than the fact that right. he just like killed a bunch of people. <laughs> but she she was like, look, grieving is totally understandable. Yeah. And uh, uh, they killed your mother. So I guess it was cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was a bad way to deal with the tragedy yep. that she looked past just because he was a Jedi. In that moment, his projection onto Padme was motherly. Yeah. Ooh. Right? So she fulfilled the role of the mother in the in the understanding for yes. him. And she gave him forgiveness. So it allowed him to carry his shadow longer. Kind of the curse that Anakin is given mm -hmm. through all of this is that he has to remain in the underworld. Yes. Because he's unable to find his true self and he's unable to... Um, he's... And that, that is explored symbolically yeah. very well in the Darth Vader comic. Uh, yeah, you think? Uh, I, I just I explained it like that matter-of-factly. Like, yes, he I is mean, in the underworld. 
Vader is in the underworld. And we like if we're talking from a reverse on a dollar perspective, yeah. Ben is also still in yeah. the underworld. But, yeah, yeah, Ben Ben has put himself in the underworld as well. But yeah. He's trying to figure out where his missing feminine is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like where where is it? Hello. Yeah. But Ben's is on um, um, Ben's journey is uh less it it, it it it's more relatable than Vader's is. Um which brings me to <laughs> uh, how Ray and Ben incorporate the shadow into their two journeys. Yeah, let's talk yeah, about that. Let's talk about that. So a lot of the time with Ray and Ben, it's so fascinating because they tend to push and pull on their own shadows when they're together the most. Um, Ray, Ray explores her shadow without Ben, but she understands her shadow better when she is talking to Ben. Because she's probably projecting her shadow on him. Exactly. And in the same right. moment, he is projecting his shadow onto her. And it's... That's so cool. It's so cool. And we, yeah, we see that happen visually. That's so cool. Yeah. Like in the hut scene when they're all sharing their their um, feeling of aloneness. You know, I'm so alone. Yeah. Well, you're not alone. Neither are you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it comes It comes and, to that. Like, But even, even so, like before that, um, when mm-hmm. they're well, uh, the, every scene, at, well, every scene in the Last Jedi that they have together, where they're doing the Force connections, is that it's an emotional sparring. Um, it mm-hmm. is it is po- poking and prodding at each other, projecting on each other. Well, even even the um, interrogation scene in TFA is a yeah because they talk they're they're literally in psychoanalysis together. Yeah talking about each other's baggage their garbage that they're carrying around with them it's like you're alone you dream of an island (laughs) you're so afraid and she's like look you're afraid too you idiot (laughs) you're afraid you're never gonna be the same the strongest Darth Vader you can literally hear them in couples therapy (laughs) that's amazing yes Yes, you can. Right, yes. right, right, yes. right. Because they're projecting on each yes. other, right? It's like, well, actually, Ben is alone. Yeah. And actually, in that moment, Ray is so afraid. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they're they constantly doing this to each other. <laughs> they're calling each other's uh, own garbage to them, to each other. Yeah. But, I mean, the loneliness is a shared feature of the boat of both of yeah. them. And so when they're able to call it out, they're like, actually, yes, but you know, actually together, maybe we're not so much alone. And it's not just like loneliness. Like it also is the lack of a mentor, the lack of a, mm-hmm. a person to lead them. And, uh, with with Ben separation, separation from, from family. family specifically with Ben it's the separation from his mother with Ray it's the separation from both the parents. both parents and 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 I say it's for for Ben it's it is both as well but with Ben it's more uh, leaning on yeah the mother. it's more leaning on the mother and I don't know how yeah. it's gonna be with Ray I th- I feel like Ray's gonna be. I feel like Ray, with Ray, it's going to be more lenient on her mother as well, because that's psychological. That is like leaving the mother's nest. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, it's all, it's all wrapped up in psychology. It also, yeah, and it also ties into the heroine's journey yeah. uh, more strongly that she left her mother, and it was yeah. that was a more formative experience for the character too. Which is funny because that that's actually the, it's the same for the male. Uh, it. it it's, it's yeah. very much both are the yeah, same. Yeah, they're the same. Again, the the first part of the, the heroes and their heroines. Yeah, are the same. internally, yeah, they're exactly the same. Um, I find that fascinating. But with that being said, I'll just say like kind of like Ray's journey uh, in terms of like experiencing her shadow. We've talked about this a thousand times, so I won't go too far into it. It's d- diving into her past, experience re-experiencing her birth by falling into her mother's womb symbolically, and we see that symbolically in The Last mm-hmm. Jedi when she dives and falls into the mirror cave and falls into the water basically mm-hmm. and looks like a little fetus. Yeah, there. she does. She curls up, yeah, when she falls into the water. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then she she comes out and is born. Yeah, is reborn. Again. And uh and f- funny weird side note is that last time I watched this, uh 
I was watching it with Corey and Corey, I, 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 I was talking about the rebirth symbolism about her falling into the womb and like looking like a fetus, the way she was curled up. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. and yeah, and there happens to be like a skeleton there. And I had just happened to like, I just had re- recently read a, a bit of Young where he had talked about finding the skeletons in his dream and recognizing they were part of the human subconscious. And there's a huge beast of a skeleton at the bottom of the of the pool that she falls into that's there. And if you go back to the the art, no, but if you go back to the art, if you go back to the art, right? Yeah. The art of The Last Jedi, there was a huge ass skeleton. It was huge. It was kind of like it was kind of reminiscent of uh, like Phantom Menace. The uh, there's always a bigger fish oh, kind of thing. It was a big fish kind of skeleton. And instead of taking that imagery, Johnson took the imagery of a skeleton that was just very small, kind of in the bottom corner. Yeah, like. Ray kind of falls into the womb and she's there and there's this little skeleton on the side. But also like the underwater is also the subconscious. Yes. Yeah. So to me. So, and reflected with the skeleton. Right. right. So to me, the skeleton mm-hmm. is there to remind us of things that have come to pass. Literally. Yeah, and it's literally like a signpost to be like, look, symbolism is important. Yeah. Things that have come to pass, the history history of humanity is being told in the story. Do we need to remind you again with a literal little skeleton signpost? Yeah, because they do it over and over again. Last cool. Jedi, they do it again with the when she's experiencing the Force on the island. Life, death, like she's going through it. Mm, she's they rebirth. rebirth. Yeah. She she looks at the skeleton buried in the ground again and again it's reminding us of that and it and now understanding kind of like how young and Bly viewed the subconscious i'm like oh mm-hmm. well that's also an a signal to us that it's whatever has come before them is in them they're symbolizing they're symbol sing- signaling us yes because <laughs> they, they're symbol signaling <laughs> sure I we'll go with that. that i mean you know, they, they are telling us, pay attention to this subconsciously. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's dope. Like, Ray has a lot of symbols, like, in her journey. Okay. Mm-hmm. Ben's a little bit more difficult to decipher. There was a cool book. Mm-hmm. Cool. Is it a cool it's a book? Cool, it's a, it's a great book. It. It's a great book. So Herman Hess, which I don't know how to s- pronounce his last name, so I apologize. It's Herman H E S S E wrote this book called Damien or Damien, however you want to pronounce it. He was German, so I don't I don't know. So, but it's it's spelled D E M I A N, and the it, it's one of those stories that is involved heavily in Jungian thought. Hermann Hesse was very much inspired by Jung. His work is taught through the lens of Jung, through archetypes and through the idea of the shadow and all of that. And he wrote his book to kind of reflect on what was going on in Germany before the war, what was going on in Mm. society and what was happening in his subconsciousness. So he wrote it from an, from an perspective kind of straddling reality, like his reality, his kind of autobiography, and also a subconscious level of thought that he had in a retro perspective aspect. And what we have is the story called Dimian. And it's written by the point of view of Emile Sinclair, who is a normal like German boy growing up during this time period. And he meets a little boy named Demian, and that becomes his guide for his true self. But he has to go through this entire journey, and it's very short. It's a very short book, and to quantify it, it's actually shorter than Dooku. Oh, Dooku yeah, Jedi Lost. It's actually shorter than Dooku Jedi Lost, which was like six hours from right. a audiobook perspective. It's yeah. about an hour I mean, shorter. And- from an audio wow, perspective, so it's like, yes. Yeah, so it's like half the size of a novel because a novel is usually around 10 hours. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty short. Um, and, you know, I read it I, I read it over a period of time. It took me a while to get through it because uh, it's 
it gets weird. It gets weird towards the middle. But basically, all it is, if you look at it from a certain perspective, it's just about a young boy trying to figure out his true self. And he keeps projecting his his insecurities, he keeps projecting his shadow onto mentors and onto physical beings that come into his life. And I think <laughs> from a weird standpoint that that is Ben. And I can't get over this idea. Okay. I can't get over this idea. I'm still, I, I, I will be proven right, right or wrong with the rise of Skywalker. I will, but I'm still on point here. So the idea behind Demi, like Demian, is every chapter is a new step in S- Emile Sinclair's life. And the first chapter is representative of childhood. The next chapter is representative of like teenage hood however you want to call it and as he moves throughout life he he ends up going through basically what ends up becoming campbell's hero's journey essentially Mm -hmm. because he moves through all of the archetypes that young ever talked about but hest does this in a way that's like hest tries to basically pull in his own journey through this story and like i said Mm -hmm. before it's like part autobiographical part he wants to represent his ide- ideology he was a poet so he's kind of like bly in this regard i i kind of rep- mm-hmm. i i would compare him to bly mostly but he does a really good job in representing young's ideas of that time in a story format as opposed to in like that weird cyclical way that young talked and in that weird kind of mm-hmm getting in and out of depression way that young mm-hmm. experienced life. So Demian teaches us a few things. And I'm trying to summarize them but in the best way that I can, but I hope people could try to read it. It's very short. Each step in his journey, he encounters a new mentor or some kind of god or goddess that he puts up on a pedestal as saying, this is my truth. This is, this is what I have to live by. This transcends God right? The God that he grew up with. So he follows that for a short period of time and then he finds the flaw in it and then he, and then he falls away from it, mm. right? So mm-hmm. he leaves the feminine, which was, in the first chapter, he has like his home and he has his mother and he has the comfort of his own home. And he leaves that because he meets Demian. And Demian is representative of his true self. Demian sp- emotionally spars with him. Demian questions his ideology, questions the church, questions his family, questions his ideals. And Sinclair is like, I don't know what you're doing to me. I don't know. I don't know how to take this. I don't know. I don't know what to do with this because he's not emotionally ready to go through this journey yet. So it keeps, he keeps doing this every once in a while. Demian keeps coming back into Sinclair's life. And through that journey, Sinclair goes on this journey of leaving his home, leaving the feminine. He goes through a point, he goes through the shadow at multiple times of his life. He goes through cynicism, deep cynicism. Like, I found this very fascinating. He finds himself believing that nothing matters. And the only, like, very nihilistic. Very nihilistic. He's getting drunk at very odd hours all hours of the day having talks with people in the bar he leaves the con- he leaves the bar not knowing what he talked about with them only that he feels like you know rebellious or whatever and he goes through that he goes through a period where he sees a woman and he believes that that's his answer it's his goddess he finds a goddess he doesn't go up to talk to her Ooh. he just names her beatrice and he admires her from afar and he tries to live a celibate life because of her <laughs> it's very, it's very silly and then he goes through a period where he finds a master called prestorius who teaches him about a god who is both god and devil and combines mm. the evil and the good and he believes that this, this new religion is the real truth and then he finds mm. out prestorius just really wants to create a new because he's got a big ego and he's a hurt and he's a man that is very hurt. So then he goes back into his shadow. He goes back into cynicism. And then he rediscovers Demian. And then he meets Demian's mother. And he sees Demian's mother as what he likes to call the universal mother, the mother Eve. The Frau Eva, I, I guess in, in German. Basically, it's this anima. Demian, who he has been searching for his whole life, 
He finally finds him again and connects with his mother. And again, that is that is his way back to himself. And it is part sexual, <laughs> which is very strange. But Demian is Demian is like Sinclair's self, but it's not enough for Sinclair to know Demian. He has to take the full mm-hmm. journey through all these other mentors and all of these other characters in his life to experience mm-hmm. the full journey, to understand himself, to understand Demian. And at the very end of the story, this is a spoiler, but, you know, like, go read it because it doesn't make any sense unless you do. It ends in a kiss. Who kisses who? Mm-hmm. Sinclair is injured in war, and he's sitting in a hospital bed, and Demian comes up to his bed and says, my mother told me that if you were ever hurt, to give you this kiss. Interesting. So Demian kisses Sinclair, but it's actually Demian's mother kissing Sinclair. And at that moment, Demian has a vision of himself opening a door to the basement of his mind and discovering his true self. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, boy, boy. Yes, that is the masculine way to discover oneself if I ever did read anything like that. (laughs) Hey, okay, so, so I told you this whole thing. I told you this whole thing, and I'm about to blow your mind. No, I I get it. I'm about to. Let's take our listeners on this I'm journey. I'm blow your mind. You know what modern story this relates to? What? This is Fight Club. Of course, of course, it, course is. it is. Yeah, you're like, oh, <laughs> of course it is. Yeah. Because Tyler Durden is his imaginary. Truth yeah. Truth. yeah. It's Fight yeah. Club. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. And and like the woman he's infatuated Marla. with is like, Marla is like his projection of femininity and stuff like that. Okay. So yeah. I, 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 I've become absolutely obsessed with this story in terms of like the masculine. And I was talking to Corey about it and Corey, Corey goes, oh my God, it's like Fight Club. And I was like, oh my God, it's like Fight Club. <laughs> and we ended up talking about it for like hours. Yeah. Um, and eventually I, I looked it up online and I found that other people had come to the same conclusion, obviously, because it's so apparent. It's yeah. so apparent. This gets me back to the idea that men's and women's journeys are incredibly different. Incredibly different. I read mm-hmm. Demian from the beginning. I thought this is a journey that can be re- like everyone can relate to this absolutely 100%. And then all of a sudden he starts seeking out this, you know, anima. And I was like, he was trying to find his feminine, and, and 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 I understand that in a way, but then he found Eva, which was Demian's mom, and I was like, I don't get this. This is incestual to me. It doesn't make any sense to me, and it is incestual, but I can't relate to that. Like, I don't understand that. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's not my journey, you know. Um, I'm not projecting mm-hmm. my mother onto my mentors. Well, you're not you're not projecting your femininity onto your right, own yeah, yeah, necessarily. And like you know, like I, there, there, it doesn't have to be just a man versus woman thing. It can be like women can have mo- mommy issues just as much as they can have daddy issues, and vice versa. Yes. Like like men can have mommy or daddy issues. It doesn't matter. Like we all have our we all have our garbage. Oh, good, good yeah. old garbage bag reminder. Garbage bag behind us, baggage. Yeah, stinky is also exactly. Our shadow. It's all and our dark, dark side. side. It's all our shadow. We're dealing with it constantly. <laughs> you never finish dealing with it. If you feel you figure out something, you have something else coming down the line. Better bet your bubble gum. Damn it. Yeah, yeah, and and like that's the thing is like it's it's always you have to understand that it's always there and that like by ignoring it and not dealing with it. And I think that it was like some youngians count dealing with the shadow as like no like cleaning your house no because that again that that talks about it like you're eradicating it though no but like but it's like no 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 but it's like maintenance like you have to deal oh with well that's the shadow a good point ongoing. I guess that's a good point yeah that's what I was trying to say it's like a chore like you have to do it regularly. It's like something you have to do. You have to take care of the mental clutter. You have mm-hmm. to take care of the garbage to understand, okay, which of this is recycling versus Well, that's the thing, right? That like you do to have understand. to be able to decipher. You can't just clean the house. You have to actually be able to decipher what is recycling and what is garbage. Like you you have to understand like yes. do I need to actually deal with this and talk about it? Do I need to go to therapy? Do I need to talk about this with my partner? Do I need to talk about this with my yeah. child? Do I need to talk about it with my parent? Like, you have to go through that. 
You have to cycle through that. Yeah. That's so fascinating that you talked about the Dimian, the mm-hmm. like guy who is like both good and evil trying to uh, create a new cult or it's a, a new big part of Dimian. He yeah. totes reminds me of Snoke and being like, ah, l- a child of light and yeah, darkness. So, you are perfect. So, this is so funny. A lot of people would put uh, Pistorius, they would say, oh, he's not He's not any of the archetypes. Like if if you go through Dibion, you can say each one of his mentors was an archetype of, of a Jungian ar- archetype. Mm. But when it comes to Pistorius, they all go, ah, well, he wasn't really one of them. But like that's kind of the most important one because – um. Like, he was really important to Demian. And the idea of Abraxas, which is a god that he presents in that book, has literally been, like, gripped onto mm-hmm. by so many people. There, You can find people nowadays that look at the idea of Abraxas as their actual god. It's a combination like of the, god and the devil. Wow. It's a god... That they see that holds both the good and the evil. It's kind of a it's kind of a satire on religion, but it's also this elitism. It reminds me of the uh, in in Star Wars and Legends of Luke Skywalker, kind of the uh, what is it that with the opals and the the tear opals and the 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 lords and ladies of the gem that uh, believe that they are above the suffering of the galaxy because they have created yes. a higher purpose. That's what it reminds me of. Uh, the way the Pistorius uh-huh. talks and how he presents himself, and the way that Demian or the way that Sinclair is able to kind of take him down with a very simple phrase reminds me of of the gym it reminds me of the elitism that the gym had where they felt like they were apart from all of society and the war and the conflict and i very much always felt like that was like the these uh structures of the jedi and the sith uh, you know how they were once together and now separate but you know they still believe that they are kind of elite amongst yeah. the populace yeah. of the which galaxy. is why people took them down in such a uh, public way like when they when they try to take them down they took they try would always try to take them down in such a public way like of course they would yeah i find a lot of snoke in that because yeah. of, like it being a singular person who's like i have the path i have the way you should follow me yeah. the new the new way and you you are the are the one the combination yeah. of so good and evil. that actually this is so funny yeah this is this is basically where i was going with that thank you for getting me back on track <laughs> so uh that 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 is ben like ben ben's looking for this like truth at least we believe he is we are not we're not we're not sure, we're not sure yet mm-hmm. we're not in his head yet he puts like he puts the he goddess, puts the on, goddess Rey. on Rey. He, he sees her he well and then he's disappointed in her <laughs> <laughs> when yeah. when he's like, don't do, he's you're like, not doing what I want you like, to do. Wait, you're wait my, <laughs> you're you're that part that I need to be complete. And then she doesn't do that, and he goes, well, damn it, like. So are we gonna get a kiss from Leia given to Ben by Ray? I wish that would be that would be so incredibly like perfect. Yeah, because I think yeah. it might like or like a hug, right? The hug, the hug that Leia gives. Ray in the trailer the hug maybe the hug is given in the same way and it'll be just be very symbol maybe it'll just be very sim- symbolic or I don't she know. could straight up say this is from your mother I hope so ah. but at the same time like there's a lot I, I don't like to speculate necessarily because obviously like Carrie is not with us anymore so the best symbol that they could have done to transfer that goddess you know, Mother Eve energy. They couldn't do it in the way that they wanted to do it. I think they always yeah. intended Carrie to reconcile with yeah. her son. I th- or sorry, Leia to reconcile yeah. with Ben. I always think that, but like people have speculated, like what if Leia is hugging Ray and she knows that Ben is on the other side of that hug and he can like feel it through the force yeah. bond or some sort of stuff like that. But it could be just as simple as Ray hugs, you know, Ben in the end for his yeah. mother. Right. Yeah. And if she says this is from your mama, <laughs> Ty will die. die I will. Theater. I will absolutely die. Yeah. Resurrect me. Yes, please. Yeah. There. There will be resurrection yeah. in that. And, oh my yes. god. I will. I will absolutely die. It's like insane <laughs> to me. I mean, so the point is, you need to. Your projections mm-hmm. are out there, 
And you need to bring them back into yourself to fully understand those aspects. And that's the only way is to actually talk to those shadow parts of ourselves, almost negotiate. However, that you need to fight them for a while. You need to eat them for a while. You need to figure out what works for the different shadow aspects of yourself. And Ben needs to do this specifically, but also Ray needs yeah. to do it too. Right. They need to negotiate and they've kind of gone back into hiding and projecting on others. <laughs> <laughs> like literally Ben is back hiding under a mask and we've talked about masks yeah. before. But from a Jungian perspective, masks are literally the personas that we reflect out in the self because we're trying to protect our, our true experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> so him wearing the mask, we're like, yeah, I guess he's trying to protect himself again. Oops. <laughs> And, you know, the only way that you can actually do that is bringing these things out into the open to have conversations yeah. about them. And I totally expect, like, maybe we'll get like, a, you know, a projection of Ben Solo onto, because we've already seen that there's a lot of parallels between Poe Dameron and Han Solo. We might get some fatherly projection onto Poe Dameron when they interact in the movie. I think that would be really yeah, kind of neat to see yeah. Ben treating Poe like yeah. Han. That would be so cool. Oh, so many cool things. And like, all they can do is is understand those different aspects of themselves by by playing it out and having it come together and and playing with those different things. And we'll probably see that happen from a humor perspective. Uh, with can we Kylo. just have like Poe say something like totally Han, like totally Hawny, and like have Ben respond to it like how More yeah honey. like oh or 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 at first like <laughs> how dare you inflect my father yeah Wait, that's, that's my, my dad. dad like what and are you doing almost co go into competition with him yeah, and then like they like have a banter yeah. back and forth. Who can be more? Oh, yeah. Who can be more Han? Be... <laughs> who could be more Han until he like kind of incorporates that piece of it? Like honestly, I think that's what's going to happen when they're all on that like desert area because we know they're yeah. all like, together in that situation. I think that's what's going to happen. I think there's going to be some like play with the different like. Mm, uh, he's probably going to project a little bit onto Finn. Yeah, and you know, about the traitor aspect of himself. Yeah. And like, so he might even call him a traitor, mm -hmm. but like jokingly. I could see, I could see JJ. We, we, we could see some JJ of that. JJ loves flirting with the ensemble. Like he loves, he loves yeah. the ensemble, like having banter. Like interplay. Yes. I think, I think we're going to get some sort of weird ass, like, and he might even like poke fun at C-3PO in a, in a Han Solo kind so. of way. And then Poe would be like, that's what yeah. I was going to say. Or like, like we might get like all of these projections playing out live <laughs> on screen. And I would just like die of laughter because I'd be like, oh, my God, <laughs> these things. Because he's just trying to work through his own trash bag yeah, of garbage. Of course. As he's like understanding who he is actually yeah. on the inside. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say like it. it like we've talked about Damien, Demian. We've talked about Robert Blythe, who's a poet, and we've talked about Star Wars. And fiction is a perfectly awesome way to understand our own trash yes. bags, which is again our shadow, our darkness, our dark side, to understand these things about ourselves. And Ty and I actually have spoken about this. This is how we process our own st stuff we carry around yeah. with us. And it's perfectly normal yeah. and good and actually kind of healthy to use fiction and words. And Blythe himself in his own book is like, sometimes the best thing that you can do is read about other shadows. Sometimes the best thing you, you can do is use words to describe shadows because it's better than acting out and lashing out there in the world is to think about these shadows and the things that we do in a view, in a lens through the fiction that we consume. Yeah. Well, so it's cool. So what, it's cool. It's, so it's cool. cool. In, enjoying Star Wars. It's good. It's therapeutic. I, I write your prescription. <laughs> Watch some Star Wars. And I, I, I really want to get to your meta meta point because I think it's really important. Oh, yeah. We didn't really, really in, even talk about... It'll be, um, it'll, it'll, it needs so, to be the final point. 
It, it, it's important. It does. It's really important. This this is important. So, okay. Part of the Jungian psychology, part of what Robert Bly talks about when he's talking mm-hmm. about the shadow, part of this whole idea is that we ought not only have a personal shadow. We not only have a a shadow that exists within our community, but we also have like a national Mm -hmm. shadow, like a shadow that exists at like a country identity level, right? And so, and how he describes it is, so we've talked a lot, a lot about personal shadow and we've all talk a little bit about a town shadow. So it's like town shadow is like the secrets that are kept within your smaller community. Oh, can I say something real quick to add to this? So I actually did my like sure. I did my undergraduate thesis on like racism in communities and I did it like on mm-hmm. different levels of communities. So like the town, mm-hmm. the community like or the neighborhood versus the town versus the city versus the state versus the mm-hmm. country versus like the world. The world. Mm-hmm. It's a, an incredibly important to like make sure that whenever you're talking about something, you're talking about it in realms in the realm of of whatever that uh, measure is. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking mm-hmm. about the neighborhood versus if you're talking about the world versus if, if you're talking about in the country, it becomes incredibly different. So I just wanted to I wanted to say that. Because I think it's really important. Yeah. And so, like, I want to say that there's different shadows out there. And as a society, a community of Mm -hmm. persons, we have collective unconsciousness and collective shadow. Mm -hmm. And that, that shadow manifests itself based on the types of members within that community and the collective garbage baggage things that we are carrying around with us. And I want to say that the Star Wars fandom community that participates publicly. So this is not for the people that experience Star Wars in the comfort of their own home and never engage in public discourse. This is people that are choosing to participate in the community Mm -hmm. of Star Wars. So that is on Twitter, on Instagram, on Reddit, on Facebook. It is people who are engaging in the public community where we can engage in a larger Mm -hmm. fan base. Yeah. We as the community of Star Wars have a collective unconsciousness and a shadow. And the shadow's main challenge right now, and we can see it play out in all of the confused fans that are like, I don't like The Last Jedi. I don't like the new sequel trilogy. It's stupid. It's not t- It's not good storytelling. Is the missing mm-hmm. feminine. And Again, go back. If you have not listened to The Feminine Gaze or maybe re listen <laughs> to it, that episode is so good at explaining the missing feminine in Star Wars. I can't even repeat what we said because it was so good <laughs> in the moment. So high yeah. five, Ty. Um, <laughs> I'm glad so many people liked it, apparently. <laughs> I want to talk about why that is so important. And I want to just reiterate some of the amazing feedback that mm-hmm. we've had from that episode. Cause this is almost like a weird part two. Yeah. Of that episode. It is, so, yeah. Like it happened six months later, but there. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, how long heck? it takes. <laughs> um, that's how long it takes for us to come up with ideas. We are not slow, but we are good or we're slow, but we're good, I guess. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. So normally, my stats on my show are 80% mm. women, 20% men. I love this fact so much. That episode is now at 60% <gasps> male listeners, 40% female listeners. Literally men are seeking out their missing feminine in themselves mm-hmm. to understand themselves. And and I'm not lying. If you go and like look at the YouTube channel comments, you will literally see men go, I never understood myself until I listened to this episode of your <laughs> podcast. And I have had emails and I have had Twitter messages where they're literally like, I started talking to my wife yeah. in a different way because I I kind of understood like the feminine in myself now. And I like, I don't, Like, it literally makes me cry to think about that, like, this podcast could have even that kind of an influence on anyone. But 
like, I really do want to thank you for taking the time to listen to it. Cause this is like mostly about me and Ty trying to have conversations and understand fiction and understand, you know, our own yeah. garbage, garbage bags that we drive yeah. behind us. But the fact that you got something out of this is so important because that is the shadow of the Star Wars fandom is the missing yeah. feminine is the is the missing aspects of storytelling that people don't understand and they don't understand about themselves. So, you know, if you haven't listened to it, go and check it out. It's really, really awesome. And again, you might find something missing about about yourself in it. If you don't, that's cool, yeah. too, you know, but allowing yourself to see yourself as a projection through the fiction that we watch is mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. No, I, I, I didn't understand how much people were affected by it until weeks, weeks after it was released. And then all of a sudden you were like, oh, my God, Ty, look at the look at the stats. And I was like, oh, what? Like, <laughs> and the comments, some of the yeah, comments like I was like floored by, like, are you kidding me? Like I said, mm -hmm. I said things in that episode I thought no one would ever hear. <laughs> but I mean, that's kind of the point. I I'm a very candid person. I think that I think mm -hmm. that that's how I think that's how we should talk about these things. Star Wars is meant to be a human yeah. story. So you feeling mm -hmm. things because it is telling you things visually, symbolically, through the music, literally telling you how you should feel is yeah. the point. It is the point. It's trying to tell you about humanity. It is trying to be that projection so you don't need to project on your spouse and yell at your spouse yeah. because you're projecting your shadow onto your spouse. It's trying to help you. And yeah, it's going to make money in the meantime, but that's cool. <laughs> you got to pay it back somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Right? So I wanted to highlight like one thing before we like start to wrap up, which is that the anger, mm -hmm. I think that it's really important for people to understand that a lot of the anger that a lot of young men and women, some women, are feeling towards mm -hmm. the sequel trilogy is is literally just their their baggage, their shadows, their projections. It doesn't make them lesser. It doesn't make them. It's actually a, it it is actually a phase of them understanding yeah. their shadow. They're being rattled yeah. by the fact that the shadow exists. Yeah. I right. They're understanding the shadow is out there, and it, it freaks, freaks them, them out. out. I've seen many threads that have said why I don't like you know any kind of aspect about Rayla, or like why I don't want to see mm -hmm. any more Beauty and the Beast archetypes, or why I don't like this. What whatever. I understand that like society goes through changes and goes through different. <sighs> It goes through different phases to get over certain types of collective baggage or whatever. It's like collective yeah. trauma. It's like the things that we can't talk about, yeah. right? And I would say this is a this is an aspect of it. It's like it, women taking a role in society is baggage that we still to this day have not. No, because uh, we don't. We still are processing what it means to have a feminine story. And we literally have the blueprint for it a thousand times over, but we're not, first of all, we're unwilling to accept how similar it is to the male's journey. Mm -hmm. And second, <laughs> if it's written by a male, it becomes invalid. Which is not necessarily true. It's just that they, un they need to understand the feminine aspects of it and then have it be reviewed for understanding yeah <laughs> which which is funny because like li literally ryan johnson wrote every page of the last jedi and sent it to carrie hart with the story <laughs> group who reviewed every aspect every yeah. day he would write he sent it to carrie hart who would read it and give him feedback every yeah. single day so that's what's required right yet yeah. so from yeah. a femme gaze perspective it is, of course, ideal to have these things written by women. And Ty and I, when we did our Asian drama podcast, talked a lot about how many of the Asian dramas were actually written by women. But primarily, they're written from a femme gaze storytelling mm -hmm. structure. And that's more what's important because you're never going to get rid of no. all men in you a can't. production. It's just not, it's not possible. And nor yeah. should you because what's important is that, look – both men and women are involved in the storytelling because yeah. then it'll speak to everybody. 
it'll speak to the feminine and the masculine and the masculine yeah, and the feminine absolutely yeah and there's like there's moments where you can like you can ha- you can be devoid of all feminine you can be devoid of all masculine if the purpose mm-hmm. is truly to explore what it means to, to be devoid of that but <laughs> i mean but but that's 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 an acknowledgement right like that's an acknowledgement mm-hmm. that you have in the art that you're producing uh, like kind of like how Ghostbusters, right? The feminine Ghostbusters. They were trying to have a full on female production of it. Okay, well, let's see what that's like. Like, 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 let's give them, let's mm-hmm. give them the arm to do that. It's like choosing to paint with oils yeah. versus acrylics. Like you're kind of making an artistic yeah. choice here, right? I'm gonna tell it in a specific way. But Star Wars, although it's trying to go from a for a more feminine story or to explore yeah. the missing feminine in the storytelling is not necessarily trying to alienate no, men. Not at all. Right? It's trying to tell universal storytelling, which mm-hmm. involves, again, the missing feminine. The missing feminine. feminine. It's incredibly important. I mean, I've talked about it independently. You've talked about it independently. We've talked about it together. I can't harp on that aspect enough. And you said it in here, and I, I want to say it again because it's really important to me, but that – the idea that there is a collective shadow in the Star Wars fandom, as well as in the Star Wars universe, that is missing the feminine, that is the point. That is the mm-hmm. point. And, and and it does reflect fandom, but it doesn't reflect fandom in every instance. It doesn't it doesn't reflect fandom mm-hmm. as like the current state of fandom. That's not the point. The point is that it reflects the ongoing evolution of the myth. And how people how people perceive the myth and how they come to consume, yep. believe, and interpret mm-hmm. the myth and the collective Absolutely. unconscious. And and so far, it's been a very very male centric myth. Mm-hmm. And now we're getting kind of this female aspect of it. I mean, the introduction of mm-hmm. Ahsoka was one of the largest feminine introductions in the story we had padme which was great sure Mm -hmm. um and of course shmi and all of those people but overall the prequels themselves were devoid of Mm -hmm. femininity whereas it actually if you look at the clone wars george was like wait a second maybe i need to reevaluate everything and so what did he give anakin he gave him a maiden projection of his own his own self yeah yeah that was yeah absolutely a thousand percent wow (laughs) And yeah, we could talk about this for probably 10 yeah. more hours because um, literally we could. But I think that we did a pretty good job of kind of showing the shadow aspects, why they were yeah. important, you know, why they were important to George Lucas, especially how they're currently influencing the storytelling mm-hmm. of today and maybe how you can take a little bit of this home with you. Yeah. And like to, the understanding of like the, the shadow is not just darkness. It's not evil. It's not evil no. at all. It's actually uh, it's energy. energy and it's energy. It's creativity. Mm-hmm. It's almost, and I, I will eventually get into it. This in one of my way of the way mm-hmm. of the force episodes, and maybe I'll have you back Ooh. for that because I think I think we could get into this. But it is the living force. Yeah, talking about the different ty- yes, the cosmic force versus living force. Yes. Yeah, I like that. Yes, cosmic force yeah. versus living force because um, the living force is creativity. It is yeah. growth. It is all of these things, mm-hmm. right? It is also, it is the death that springs new life. So it, it comes mm-hmm. from that. So there's lots of, there's lots going on with it. And it's really fun to talk about. Oh, that should be, that's almost like a part two of everything we just <laughs> talked about. Like, 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 honestly. It's very yeah. forcey. So yeah. And philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we'll get yeah to that definitely eventually. definitely i love it it probably won't take us six months hopefully not <laughs> now we gotta do it before the next movie comes out for sure yes we have a lot to do, still talk yeah. about before and there's only like so many months <laughs> to go but ty yeah as always, hi thank you thank for coming you. on the show where can people find you and your um people work? can find me on twitter at black underscore t-y-m on Twitter, and you can find me on YouTube at Wit and Folly, W I T and F O L L Y. And her videos are amazing. I check out. Yeah, all I actually of them. talk about this topic uh, in the in the viewpoint of the 
the little boy kind of like projecting his shadow and putting it behind him. My latest video as of probably when this when this podcast is going to be released, I assume, because it takes me a while to put out put out the videos. <laughs> takes me a while to edit. <laughs> we'll see. We'll right. see. You'll know. Thanks for hanging out with us and cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is the What the Force theme orchestral music by Christy Carew. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash what the force. We like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love What the Force, Night Huntress in Wild Space, Susan, Kathy, and Cassandra Corvid. We are available on iTunes, Google Play, and other podcatchers, including YouTube. If you would like to support the show in other ways, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. You can connect to us on Twitter at What the Force Show. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers. <laughs>